Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 757. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is August 30th, 2022. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. This is where Kevin is traveling in North America in an RV. Right now, you may hear a little rain on the roof. I'm sorry about that. Uh, an RV is not the perfect structure for a, a sound studio or, or video studio at all. George is down It's at your office you're at today, right? That's right. We're having a bit of a cold snap. I've had to put my earmuffs on. It's uh, only yeah. in the high 80s today. <laughs> You got a new puppy, and I don't know if you yeah. knows this yet. And uh, apparently, puppies chew things, and your puppy chewed through your little air, AirPods, huh? Yeah, well, it, it decided to. Uh, it got it open, and it couldn't get. It couldn't crack the case, but it could take apart with its little razor sharp nail uh, teeth the uh, the earpieces. So, until I get over to Best Buy, I've got to wear these uh, earmuffs. <laughs> All right, so a lot of you guys are new to the program. Our audience grew 20% over Lambeth. And so uh, please go to the comment section. And if you want to comment on stuff we talk about or make suggestions about stuff you want to hear about us, hear us talk about, please do that in the YouTube comment section. If you have not subscribed yet to Anglicon Scripted, this is a great opportunity to go to YouTube, click on the red rectangle, up pops the little bell icon. You click on that, and you will be instantly notified when there's a new show. Please like us. Anytime you see this video up here on Facebook or YouTube, there's algorithms out there in the, the cloud that help promote it if it's liked. And we had one show about a month ago go really viral, and we really appreciate that. That was you guys. That wasn't that wasn't the content. That was you guys clicking like, 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 and we appeared in more people's feed, and we thank you for that. George and Kevin want to go to Kigali, and GAFCON 4 is coming up. Uh, next spring, summer, and we need to be there because that's where Anglican News is happening. You can help send us there by making a donation. And you do that by going to anglican.inc forward slash donate. It's this hyperlink right here in, in the, the bottom of our screen and in the show notes. And you can help send us to Kigali. All right, George, let's. we got a great show going on, but how are you doing? Well, we got, friends, we got a late start today, and usually that's because I'm a sloth. I don't get moving very quickly. But I had a parishioner, family member die today, and an indication is drug overdose, uh, probably fentanyl. Uh, the, she, the woman leaves a nine-year-old girl behind, and it's, you know, I guess I'm reacting to this death with horror and sadness, but also a bit of anger against the elites in our church. The Episcopal Church and the Anglican Communion can have these great conferences and they can come up with all these wonderful things to talk about, but hardly ever do they talk about something that affects the real lives of people. Uh, be, you know, I don't particularly care about the mosquito nets and global warming and this and that. I care about drug overdoses. I care about the economy. I care about things that the people in the pews care about. And our church is so divorced from reality, they still think that Donald Trump is an issue that the church needs to investigate. It's just craziness. No, it is. I mean, here, I'll just go over to uh, a local site that I drudge. Here, here's the five uh, top headlines. Dementing Don demands a new election. Uh, the next headline must be held immediately. Indictment watch intensifies. More warnings of unrest. Uh, Biden to address country tonight. Uh, nobody really realizes the, the, the issue in the pews. It, the national media doesn't understand it. The church doesn't understand it. And culture is just completely bonkers right now. I read a report by the AP, Associated Press, that said, you should no longer address a country or a ship or anything else as a she. We must maintain a genderless, neutral language. And I go, well, what about Spanish and French and a couple other languages out there? It just, it's crazy. And you know what? The liberal church supports that type of asininess, George. It, 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 I, it drives me absolutely crazy. My blood pressure gets high just talking about it. Twice a week I have high blood pressure, George. Yeah, you know, the... 
you know, gun violence is an issue, of course. I don't mm -hmm. downplay that. But the Episcopal Church's response, for example, is totally unconnected to the reality of the problem. Whenever the bishops get together, they have one of these bishops march for gun violence, and they make all these demands for stricter laws, stricter this, stricter that. And the problem is that the people who are dying from gun violence are not dying by at the hands of registered gun owners who uh, apply these laws to them. Uh, you know, look at how many people should die in Chicago each weekend. Uh, I don't think the NRA is involved in any of these shootings. Well, no. Uh, let's go back to what you're talking. You had a parishioner die of a fentanyl overdose. Suspected. If you go to Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, people are dying every day in the streets of overdoses much more than they're dying of gun violence. We we only direct ourselves onto the word violence and guns and we're drawn to it. Oh, no. Well, drugs are violent, George. The culture of drugs are violent. Uh, they have to be imported and there's violence over the borders that have to be smuggled in. We I just read again, and we should talk about this, we talked about the Haitian drug and gun running operation from the Episcopal Church. There's more updates on that, George. Oh, the Haitian press reported this week. Oh, friends, four weeks ago, we reported that customs agents in Port-au-Prince randomly inspected a 40-foot container that was consigned to the Episcopal Diocese of Haiti, and the manifest said, relief surprise. Well, they opened it up and checked it and found it was stocked full of guns, hundreds of thousands of rounds of ammunition, automatic weapons, counterfeit currency, narcotics, and the Episcopal Diocese says, whoops, wasn't us. <laughs> Well, arrests were made this week. The diocesan accountant was arrested, an Episcopal priest was arrested, and several other Episcopal priests are helping authorities with their investigations. Port-au-Prince is going through a terrible round of gang violence. The gangs run Haiti. The governments, sure. governments doesn't do much of anything. But the gangs run Haiti, and the gangs to basically, they wage war against the other gangs. And to do that, they need guns, they need ammunition, they need all these th they need the drugs to sell to the people in the uh, slums. And here we have uh, the Episcopal Church. Some of its members, leaders, are part of the bad guys. I wonder if the bishops against gun violence will be marching in Port-au-Prince to protest the Episcopal Diocese of Haiti's accountants' arresters. In front of the cathedral. Please do that for us. I want pictures. Yeah. It, uh, uh, high blood pressure. So <laughs> it, it's crazy to see I, this. But, yeah. you know, Kevin, if we think about it, right. this, you know, perhaps it's, a, it's an important cycle. You know, if you have clergy selling weapons that kill people, then you can have bishops march against that. And it gives the bishops something to do because they certainly don't do anything spiritual. It gives them a purpose for their jobs. Think about it. It might be all part of a grand plan. Enough said on that. All right, so we talked in, I got in my show notes, Wales Gay Pride Parade. Now, something has been happening, I kind of mentioned it like two weeks ago, where the LGTB and the gays are at war over the T. Um, and this is happening more and more where the lesbians and gays want to kind of disassociate from the trans uh, activism that's going on. But when they try to disassociate, there's a war. And we saw this at a couple parades recently where the lesbians were arrested because they were dissing the trans people. And I'm like, well, this is where the war belongs for sure. Let's talk about this, George. Well, Andy John, the primate of the Anglic of the Church in Wales, put out a statement supporting Pride Week. Let me just pause for a second and tell you a bit about Andy John. Mm -hmm. He is the, uh, the primate of the Archbishop of Wales. He's the first divorced and remarried primate or archbishop. Um, the, and he is, is it's, it's alleged that he was the guilty party in the divorce. Uh, this, so... This is somebody who, even in the Episcopal Church, they wouldn't. You can get divorced, but if you're the guilty party, you can't go <laughs> higher up the ladder. And in my diocese, uh, you'll be asked to explore your vocation as a taxi driver, not as a priest. But nonetheless, here's, uh, here's the archbishop. 
And he is just bought in entirely to the radical left uh, agenda. And this week, uh, they had Pride Week in Wales, and there was going to be a big march in Cardiff. And he put out this rather saccharine statement how how much we love you and how wonderful it is to have these marches. Now, the thing is, these marches basically now consist of these really perverted exhibitionists who do these disgusting things that you don't want your children to see or even I want to see. Well, here's the funny, here's the joke that Kevin was, uh, not a ha-ha joke, but sort of a poignant joke. Lesbians were kicked out of the march by police because they disagree with the transgender people. The transgender people say they're real women, not the lesbians. Lesbians are saying with signs saying a real woman has does not have a penis. And no, that's not true. We can have a penis. And ha I, I don't even want to talk about this, Kevin. But the police expelled the lesbians from the gay pride rally and march at the behest of the transgender men or who think they're women now. You wake up one day and you find out you're the wrong kind of gay person. You know, it just, it's crazy, but I think they need to work this way out because at some point you're going to run out of uh, alphabetical letters for your acronym. And uh, they were getting really close to that. You can't well, include everything, call yourself based on the strength of diversity and just the acronyms themselves. If you go through the definitions, they don't support each other. Yeah. Well, the reason the reason why I mentioned the Archbishop of Wales marital status is because the church is governed by sentiment. It's mm -hmm. not governed by the Bible and, you know, Christian morals. Uh, how can the Archbishop of Wales say anything about uh, Christian sexual ethics when people can turn around and immediately call him a hypocrite? So what did he does? He puts out these platitudes of peace, love and happiness when I don't even think he believes it. I just think that he's that he's so bought into the culture that this is the only space left for him to be a third-rate cheerleader for a movement that is destroying Western civilization, for want of a better way of describing it. Uh, yeah, the, the agenda, you know, we have gone in America from having uh, civil unions uh, about a decade ago, 15 years ago, to gay marriage, once gay marriage uh, became adopted here in all 50 states and, and uh, uh, supported by the Supreme Court, now, years later, we have kindergartners going to strip clubs to watch drag queens strip. And then they're showing how to dance on the strip poles and how to receive money tucked into their little uh, pants. That All that is the slippery slope. They tease us about it, but... We have example after example after example of slippery slopes, and well, in in my tr in my tragedy this morning, one of the aspects of it is that uh, the father of the 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 now orphan girl is not was not married to the mother. The child was born out of wedlock. The father's acknowledged the child, supported the child. I don't and gets him all gets her on alternate weekends, and that's when he comes to church with her, but. The American working classes, marriage has now become a luxury for the rich or for, you know, it, it's the rise of illegitimacy from the margins to, uh, I don't want to say the mainstream, but to the norm. I think now in England, the majority of births are now out of wedlock. Oh, absolutely. No, no question about it. You know, the if you look at the latest statistics on marriage uh it is a minority's chore now it, you know my if you are married you're a minority mm -hmm. if you remain married you're an extreme minority if you're a minority and have uh, a wife with the same last name she took your name you're an extreme minority uh it yeah it's and and we're not just saying this because we're old-fashioned and cranky but rather for the for the stability of children and for their moral upbringing and for the well-being of society as a whole a child needs two parents one male one female at home with the child as it grows and matures yeah. was study after study after study starting with the uh uh moynihan report that you mentioned i think a month or two ago about the black family 
they called it the Negro family when it came out in the late 60s, mm -hmm. was that illegitimacy is destroying the African-American family. And no, it, it destroyed. It, it wasn't destroying. This is past tense. The African-American family of the from 1850 to 1950 has 1965 has been wiped out mm -hmm. since since the 60s and mm -hmm. now that which started 30 years ago in Mino in uh, the african-american community is now spread across the board to uh the ma majority communities in the united states and it mm -hmm. does not bode well for our society and our nation i mean mm -hmm. every study that you want to look at from rates of crime to to use drug abuse to finishing school all correlates they do with uh, parent having two parents and that's the one thing marxism wanted to do the desire of karl marx was we need to break up the family even though he lived with his family uh, the, the desire of karl marx was to break up the family and to break up the church and he, you would have better control of a society where people did not have a functioning family and where people mm -hmm. did not have a, a place where they could go and have trust and be, have encouragement and have an ability to, to learn from the generation before them. Mm -hmm. And he, he knew, hey, if, <laughs> if we want to keep having revolutions, we can't have families, damn it. And we can't have churches, darn it. And <laughs> that's America today. That's Europe today. Uh, it, it seems to be a winning argument for Karl Marx. Mm -hmm. well it's one of it's one of our jobs as christians is to stand away and apart from this culture and that means you're going to be married to the person with whom you have sexual intercourse you're going to be a faithful father you're not going to oh midlife crisis do the old-fashioned thing and buy a motorcycle don't leave your wife for another model no, if you're going to have a crisis uh but do do the right thing not just for yourself but for our society as a whole yeah. And buy American motorcycles. Oh, so you, you get the Harley. You got to get the Harley. You know, if you, if you buy the motorcycle, take your kids on the motorcycle with you with helmets. You know, you can include them in your midlife crisis. I always did. <laughs> <laughs> Except the RV. <laughs> the RV is a, a two-person only RV. All right, so let's move on to some more news. Uh, we have an update on the Charlie Holt bishop-elect, non-bishop-elect, uh, from the Diocese of Florida, and there's more news we should talk about, George. Sam Howard, the Bishop of Florida, put out a video la uh, last week, uh, which we reported on on Anglican Inc., and he's saying Diocese of Florida is going to be best pushing the reset button. They're going to restart the computer mm -hmm. on the Episcopal election process. But this is Bishop a full this is a full do over. Full do over. Okay. And he's meeting. He's and. Bishop Howard was quite clear, it's not my fault. Not my fault. I've not been involved, I've been hands off, but now I'm going to offer my sage advice as to how to go forward. Uh, he was quite, he said that the, the Episcopal Court that looked at this said they didn't find any malice, any bad intent. They just, that the, the people running the process screwed it up because they changed the rules. Uh, they threw it out, the election out on a technicality that you need to, to change the rules, you needed 30 days notice, not the short notice that was given about the rules for the election. Sam Howard said that Charlie Holt is willing to stand again for election, um, but they're essentially starting over again. Uh, who knows how this is gonna turn out? Maybe the liberals get their act together and try to torpedo Charlie or solidify around one candidate because you know it was a liberal hit job uh, in this case. Uh, that's why it was so extraordinary, because, you know, Episcopal dioceses are not the most rigorous places. Uh, and yet uh, we are having the absolute letter of the law, damn the spirit, um, because a conservative was elected. And the national church would have said, well, we need to balance the spirit versus the letter. And it's nobody complained at the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's COVID times. And of course, we have Zoom things. You know, that's the hypocrisy. And in fact, we can probably go back in the last three years, two years, and find uh, other Episcopal candidates who became bishop without a full quorum, and nobody said nothing because of their politics. But 
we we digress, George. Uh, okay, long conversation here. Buckle your seatbelts. Gafcon versus the Global South. Um, Gafcon just had a. Uh, did they have a primates meeting recently? Yes, they did. Uh, the Global South just went to Lambeth and had a wonderful, uh, pretty successful uh, uh, stage play there. I thought we could talk about the future of both of these uh, groups because they, in ways, run parallel and in ways have different goals. I Clearly, the, the goal of GAFCON is to have a, a parallel to the Anglican Communion, or at least to the Church of England. And the, the goal of the Global South is to work within the institution of Anglicanism, the Anglican Communion, to uh, set forth a more uh, traditional path and retake some of the uh, 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 ministries that have been taken over by the liberals. The Global South thinks they can work within the institution. GAFCON has given up on the Anglican institution. I think that's fair to say, right, George? Yeah, in broad terms, yes. I think you could sort of say in broad terms, not everybody, of course, on all sides will agree with this. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing uh, GAFCON uh, in some ways is becoming more exclusive in their outlook. They're becoming more, uh, well, it's a Nigeria slash Sydney show. And the characters of those diocese provinces are, are different from the rest of the Anglican Communion. The two things that keep put Nigeria and Sydney together is that they don't want anybody to tell them what to do. They're frontiersmen, both the, <laughs> the Aussies and the, the, the basic of your average Nigerian is what made America great, the frontiersmen. The, we're mavericks, we'll do it our way, uh, we'll keep it straight, we'll keep it legal, uh, but know that our way is the right way. All this goes back to the uh, the succession crisis, if you will, in GAFCON, mm -hmm. when uh, after the first blush of GAFCON, we basically had a, not a fight fight, but we had two competing groups or ideologies. One sort of surrender, uh, s s focusing on Bob Duncan, mm -hmm. who had a more Catholic, small c, understanding of things, and uh, Peter Jansen, who had a more theological understanding. Now, both would say they're Catholic, both would say they're theological, but it's uh, the, the, the emphasis. And that battle was won by Peter Jensen. And then we gradually had the formation of the Global South Fellowship. Now, originally the Global South Fellowship was those primates who didn't like, uh, who had personal animosities towards some of the primates in GAFCON. Mm -hmm. But now we're two and three and even four generations of primates later, and we're seeing different directions. Now, there's a great crossover in membership. You know, Foley Beach is the chairman of GAFCON. He's also, I think, the treasurer, treasurer of, course, yeah. of the Global South Fellowship. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing people who used to put a great deal of energy and effort into the GAFCON movement now moving their focus towards the Global South. Not in opposition, but seeing that their ideas can develop more fruitfully in the Global South environment. Somebody like Phil Ashey, the AAC leader, uh, he's played a major role in the Global South uh, Cairo meetings, and he was one of the major players in uh, GAFCON's formation. And you see Bob Duncan involved in the Global South. And at this stage of things, it seems like the Global South from the outside is overtaking GAFCON in the quote effectiveness area gafcon you know wanted to set up all these networks of wanting to do all this work on a whole variety of issues mm -hmm. and because of partially financial reasons partially personnel reasons i think only one gafcon network is really effective at this stage theological education because that's peter jensen's baby we had uh changes in the leadership of the college of bishops bishops training college for gafcon Samson Moluda was replaced by Ben Kwashi, the, the General Secretary of GAFCON, replaced the Kenyan, Samson Moluda, with a Nigerian to lead this. And now the Global South College of Bishops Fellowship Program seems to be more attractive to non-Nigerians, if you will. Mm -hmm. And 
so there's personal issues here, but there's also that theological thrust. And I think if you really boil it down to it, you have to look at the person of Munir Nice. Munir, who's retired now, but is, if you will, the grandfather of the Global South movement, has long advocated for, we need to rework the structures of Anglicanism. And that includes changing the first among equals, the Archbishop of Canterbury, from the person appointed by the British Prime Minister to a person led, you know, to another person elected from within the primate's meeting. The Archbishop of Canterbury can remain the primate of all England. That's not the issue. But rather, that leader of the Anglican world should not be, by default, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And he has behind this both political, practical, and theological historical reasons. The office of the Archbishop of Canterbury has no foundation or history as a leader in any of the Anglican formularies or the Reformation or the Book of Common Prayer, any of this stuff. It's a 20th century innovation that arose out of the British Empire. It has nothing to do with uh, God and salvation or in church order ecclesiology. And so Muneer is saying we need to reform the office and call it something else and have it a different person. It may well be the Archbishop of Canterbury in the future, but it shouldn't be only the Archbishop deciding. Second, we have the numbers to really can run the Anglican Consultative Council, but instead we've allowed the liberals by their money to sort of take over that show. We've allowed the Lambeth Conference to be not a conference of bishops, but just basically a glorified graduate school seminar where you get to sit in small groups of eight, talk all you want for 50, 40 minutes, somebody else writes down what you said, and then the Archbishop of Canterbury decides what he wants to do with it. You know, this is not, this, you know, Tito Zavala, uh, the uh, primate of Chile, I uh, need to look up at his exact words, but he it's, it was confusing. Yeah, it was confusing. And what was the other word he said? Well, I got to find it. Well, I'll make a good up word. Disorganized. <laughs> uh, here it is. Confusing and complicated. Mm -hmm. Tito has been at three of these and they've each been different. And now we're at a point where we complained last time around in 2008 that this was just Rowan Williams being a graduate school graduate seminar leader here we had a uh, middle management training class where you go to do a weekend retreat and have the people you know you get your tote bag you get your uh, shriners convention hat and then you have an expert tell you what to think and say and do the global south is saying we don't need any of this stuff anymore but we do need to address issues like persecution by islam by narcotics, corruption, young people moving from the global south, trying to get into Europe, trying to get into the United States, what the church can do to keep people to develop the economies and the, the human capital in this global south, rather than having the best and brightest try to escape to the north for their futures. Well, I think it's important we need to note that Manir News is also really big on a covenant. Yes. We yes. need to be able to identify and uh, define Anglicanism and what provinces are Anglican. Now, he had a tiered system, or the covenant that was proposed before had kind of a tiered system to that, but, you know, is a covenant the way forward? Yes, that, this is where the Global South, uh, my understanding, sees the future. Mm -hmm. Rowan Williams tried the covenant approach and it was shot down by the Australians, uh, because Philip Aspinall, the Archbishop mm -hmm. of Brisbane, was a primate at the time. He didn't want anybody to tell the liberals what to do. The Church of England didn't want anybody to tell them what to do. The Episcopal Church didn't want people to tell them what to do. They prided their independence over the unity of the Catholic faith. Well, Muneer uh, and the Global South are moving towards a covenant approach. This is what it means to be Anglican. Now, GAFCON has the Jerusalem Declaration, which sort of mirrors this, but the GAFCON, the Global South covenant approach is not so much what we believe, which was the focus of GAFCON, but rather how we 
are together, what are the parameters of fellowship and faith and order? And I think they're not going to allow the mistake of Warren Williams Covenant saying if a primate says boo, that's over, but rather, okay, Michael Curry, Episcopal Church, you don't want to have this covenant? Well, the Diocese of Albany or Central Florida or Texas can sign up, or if you're a conservative parish and a liberal diocese, your church can sign up or you can sign up. In other words, your identification is sort of set by this mark and measure. Um, now, the, as I said, the, see, the distinction between GAFCON and the Global South isn't that, is, it's not a big gap between them. They both want the same things. It's how they seek to bring these about. Right. I mean, GAFCON wants a more pure approach where they have a, a parallel organization, a parallel Anglicanism, so to speak. Global South wants to work within it, wants a covenant that has accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, when we're talking about co you know this covenant, there was at one point, paragraph four, that would hold other uh, um, provinces accountable. If you do mm -hmm. something wrong, maybe you're suspended for a while. Maybe you have a three-year reprieve. Uh, maybe you have to repent to get back on to the Anglican Communion's uh, uh, good buddy page. Uh, you know, so there's a lot going on here. But yes, GAFCON and the Global South want the same thing: reform within Anglicanism. And it goes. And I can remember going back to 2003, uh, Frank Briswold at the London's Emergency Primates Meeting, mm -hmm. agreed and signed off on no Gene Robinson consecration. Then, a few months later, he, he consecrated Gene Robinson. And his response was, well, I cannot speak for the whole Episcopal Church. I can only speak for myself. And when the Episcopal Church said, no, you have to go ahead and consecrate Gene Robinson, I had to do that. Um, in Australia, uh, the diocesan, the primatial, the, the provincial structure is even looser than the Episcopal structure, the Episcopal Church's structure. So th this is the approach that, that Global South is taking to say, to have an approach that allows, let's say, an African church where the primate says something and everybody does it no matter what, to the Episcopal Church, which is the primate can say something and then, well, general convention and maybe individual diocese can say yes or no, to Australia where we don't care what the province says, it's the diocese that decides. And allow, and then to the George solution, which is semi-Presbyterian, which is, I don't care what anybody says, I and my fellow priests in this part of the country, we're all gonna sign on board. They, I think the Global South is, is feeling their way forward. And I hope to see something in September, October, where they're basically going to put out a call to how we see things going forward. I know from talking to leaders of Global South that their hope, their hope is that the Nigerians and the GAFCON team come on board with them, but we don't need uh, uh, to see these as rivals. I no, think that... I, yeah, they're not rivals, but uh, I want to get back to the covenant and having accountability. One of the biggest lackings in the Anglican Communion is accountability to one another. You know, a key foundation of Scripture, New Testament, is accountability and holding those uh, above you and with you and uh, under you accountable, and holding them to a degree of what a, the standard Christian life is. And when we don't have that in the Anglican Communion, you see how disjointed it is. I can well, do what I want to do. It's called an uh, anonymity? No. <laughs> It's called you know, autonomy. I, autonomy. autonomy. Jeez, you know, this is a late show, George. It's almost two o'clock. You know, autonomy. Um, we can do what we want to do. We're frontiersmen, and the Holy Spirit is clearly doing something new. And shame on you for not recognizing that. And well, the problem we have with accountability is that it's like pornography. We know it when we see it, but we have a hard time defining it. Hmm. What's accountability for me may not be for you, but when we see it, we know what it is. And when we see it being flaunted, like the Episcopal Church and the Canadians and Frank Griswold saying one thing to the primates and doing another thing uh, and consecrating Gene Robinson, we we know what that's flaunting accountability is. It's, it's... Well, it, when, it, it, far, as far as I can tell, in the Episcopal Church was before that. 
uh, was it George Wright? Um, Walter Ryder. Wa sorry, Walter Ryder, yeah. You know, and going back to the 1976 ordination of women, mm -hmm. uh, the general convention said no. Some bishops said, well, we're going to do it anyway. And there was no uh, consequence for those bishops who broke fellowship and went forward because, you know, they were doing this for justice and this and that and the other thing. So the, the roots of uh, are, are 50 years, 60 years in the making of why we're in this mess, especially in the Episcopal Church. Yeah, definitely. And the the answer that the Global South, uh, GAFCON's answer is to create a structure within a structure. Uh, Global South's answer is to retake the structures and then set the parameters of who can be in and who can be out. Now, looking at the, the Lambeth that was just held in Can Canterbury, I saw the Global South trying to work within structures, try to say no. I saw the Archbishop of South Sudan uh, working very hard to get his voice heard, even though you know there was the uh, virtual attempt to turn off his microphone, so to speak. So based on how screwed up the Anglican Communion is now, do you think the Global South has a chance of resetting the structures within the Anglican Communion? Yes. Uh... You know, in God, all things are possible. Seriously, Kevin. I mean, yeah. if it is, if this is of the spirit, there's nothing that's going to, to to derail this. You know, the the forces of darkness will do their best to, to obfuscate and destroy. And but truly, i yes, I am confident that in some way or another, he, the God, look at the global South did with the back office of maybe three, four people. Um, and no, no access to communications, no access to the system, and have Justin Welby at every turn seek to stymie what they wanted to do, they did pretty well. I think so, yeah. And I think the next step is for basically the Global South leadership to listen to George and Kevin how to do this stuff. <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that. <laughs> we, we have opinions, but we, we've never done this before. Um, oh. But I mean, yes, it, we have, we have. But yeah. uh, but I think it's a, it's an overarching topic: is where do we go from here? I mean, certainly the Global South had success at Lambeth, not overall success. Certainly, Gafcon has had you know a decade of success and failure. Um, just when you think Gafcon's not right, going to do it, uh, a primate flips, you know, or there's an election somewhere in Tanzania, or some a primate gets uh, arrested on fraud charges. And so, and Ben Quashi has been battling colon cancer, and yeah. he's—I mean, the, lots of variables are, are at play here. Mm -hmm. And you know, so you have all these variables. I, you know, I support both Gafka, and I certainly support the Global South, and I think they're both doing a great job. I think they could be doing more together. Is you know, uh, certainly my hope. And you know, maybe behind the scenes, they're not telling us they're doing more together. I think, especially in this day and age, you know, where we have the communications like Zoom and uh, other, you know, certainly technologies, it can be, it could be happening, George. This is why it's, I think such things like a Kigali are important because as great as Zoom is, mm -hmm. nothing beats a person-to-person -person encounter. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Kevin, you and I have gotten more news, if you will, more insight when we've sat down at, you know, at a table and had dinner or a few drinks with people than when we're on zoom and i've got 10 questions you know when you get to know the person and get and they get to know you they either they trust you they don't they see you know that personal touch i don't think can be replaced entirely by technology no in fact uh, you mentioned kigali gafcon 4 is coming up and uh if the audience would like to send Kevin and George to GAFCON 4 in Kigali. I'm putting a link for anglican.inc forward slash donate. Um, you got to start raising funds now. It's a, it's going to be expensive to go there. And to get us there, I don't know if it would probably be about $7,000 for two of us round trip. Uh, food, airfare, hotel. I'm guessing off the top of my head, I've not traveled on an airline internationally since covid but we'll, we'll put some figures together but uh it's it's time to you know 
start fundraising for that, George. Cool. All right. Hey, kind of now people, it's not a 58 minute show. No, this is the end of August. There's no news. We kind of had to create news, but I bet George has a story he's thinking about. You, you think I should want to talk about? Yeah, I'm thinking it's just about three o'clock and you can see it's gotten dark here because it it's has. about to rain. <laughs> it's going to rain any minute now in Florida. I, I don't need a watch, Kevin. I just, just need to look at the sky. Rain yeah. time. Jill was just commenting the other day, you know, in a couple of months, we'll be back in Florida for the, the winter. I said, yep. Three o'clock rain. We'll be back. Be fun. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 757 from Anglican Unscripted.